are looking at an answer to an email <coughs> from Mr. Hart. Do believers go to heaven when they die? He says, there's nothing that says that. Well, let's leave. Look, John 14, 1-4. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Presumption is they believed in him. They were following him. And he presumes with his speech, implies with his speech, they do believe in him. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. <clears throat> you know the, the way to the place where I'm going. So, let's go to where we left off. Many rooms in the Father's house do not refer to church-age believers. I'm refuting those things ahead of time as a good expositor and evangelist and sharer of the faith should. You anticipate after many conversations what people might object to, so let's get to them right off the bat. Finally, the concept of my father's house being a reference to the church, which some contend does not fit the context of this passage, and if it doesn't, move on. Don't go someplace else to try to reprove it, because this passage doesn't prove it. So, does not fit the context of this passage, which portrays the father's house as a place with many rooms, many dwelling places, which are to be prepared for the saints, not as the saints, and for which the Lord is coming back in the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18, to earth, to bring the saints back with him to his Father's house. These are believers. What did you do to get this wonderful gift to be brought back to heaven and dwell in a, in a a dwelling place in heaven for you, made for you. <clears throat> Faith alone, it's a gift. Nor is the church referred to anywhere in Scripture as the Father's house. And so many argue, well, if it's not in Scripture, you should prove it. If it's not in Scripture, it can't be proved because it's not there. But its absence proves its absence. What, I don't, what logic are you living with? So the Father's house, not the Father himself, within which... There are many dwelling places which are to be prepared, exists now, not in the future on the earth, nor is something metaphorical such as an opportunity or place made available for believers to be joined into the Godhead. And the rooms could not refer to individual believers, either, as some contend, for the disciples are indicated as remaining on earth while our Lord prepares the rooms in the Father's house away from the disciples. This is just simple reading set, reading following reading skill set. Normative rules of language, context, and logic. Especially the logic. If you're going to prepare the believers to be in heaven, you have to take the believers with you if they're going to be the heaven part. No, you're going to prepare, prepare dwelling places for the believers. And he comes back and brings the believers to heaven. What part of that don't you get out of this? Not rocket science. Although God could certainly make his home with a believer, neither violating are becoming part of the essence of that man as it indicates later on in this passage in verse 23 of John 14 which I'm indicating the belief, somebody will come up and make an objection with that. So John 14 23. Man even in his perfected resurrection body cannot because of his finite created essence abide in the infinite almighty uncreated Godhead himself and thus providing God with the finite created limitations of mankind changing God into man's fallen image his fallen finite image. And notice the conditions stipulated in verse 23 below for the believer to meet in order for God to make his home in the believer. To love God as exemplified by the believer's obedience. Recall that such is not always the case for the believer all the time. So we have 1 John 1, 8 and 10. 8 to 10. Let's take a look. Let's take a quick look at it. Virgins. 1 John 1, 8, 1, 8. If we say that we believers say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So during our temporal lives, as we are alive here on this earth, if you say you have a moment without sin, you're a liar. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. God ought to be a liar and his word is not in us. We cannot claim one moment of faithfulness that's perfect enough to be called sinless and acceptable. Other than that, it's not acceptable. 
but God in his grace accepts it anyway. By confession of your sins, you can move on. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to give us our sins, the ones we confess, <clears throat> and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So by admitting you have faults, God makes you faultless by his grace, declaring you to be without sin. Amazing. But go with the grace of God, not with your own intentions. <clears throat> In any case, so we are back to the context in John 14, 23 of temporal fellowship and not of the eternal indwelling of God within the believer. Reference John 14, 23. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. So as he loves you, self-sacrificial agape love, then you're in obedience with God, which is really only partial. Again, we have 1 John 1, 9, you have to confess because you're imperfect in it. My father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home, the same word, men, monen, with him. That doesn't mean that you're part of his Godhead. John 14, 2 continued, In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you I'm going there to prepare a place for you. That refers to heaven. I'm going to their place before you. If I prepare a place for you, speaks of a particular finite place within the father's house, which rooms exist and are to be prepared for the saints as dwelling places. Play the word place, topon. You have to take it as the words say, as dictionaries offer meanings. Dictionaries reflect how words are used in a particular language. And the new analytical Greek lexicon, <coughs> topon, refers to a dwelling place, an abode. Could be described as in a mansion that's a little bit of a, a stretch, depends upon the context, dwelling or seat. The word place cannot be misconstrued to mean the believer himself or a metaphorical condition such as death or one kind of opportunity or another, since it is already indicated in the context that Jesus is going somewhere away from the disciples to the Father's house to prepare a place in it for the disciples, plain English or in plain Greek, for whom he would have come to bring them there. So he's going to bring the disciples there. They are not there being prepared as, as part of, of God's Godhead. No, they're remaining on earth and Jesus will bring them back, ever heard of the rapture. So the word which is rendered place in this case, in the verse, cannot be construed to be something metaphorical and infinite, rather than physical and finite, because the context demands it, any more than the dwelling place of the saints can. The new Jerusalem, which will be coming down out of heaven to the earth, Revelation 21, 2. The latter is described in detail with walls, gates, with writing on them, located in the north, south, east, and west. Take it by the word, what the words say. Compare Matthew 5, 12. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Consider the false doctrine that a believer does not go to heaven when he dies, but joins into God in, instead. Then this verse in Matthew chapter 5 would be an absurd and meaningless one. If a believer undergoing severe persecution is reminded of his eternal destiny in order to encourage him to keep on being faithful and hopeful, then why no mention of such an awesome concept of being coming part of God? Answer, because it's not true. Furthermore, if a believer is not going to go to heaven when he dies, then why have a reward for him there? Answer, because he indeed is going to heaven. Now, the word reward there, don't get confused, because he's talking in Matthew 5, take a look at it, Matthew 5, 12, about being faithful. You're going to be getting to heaven, but then you're going to have a reward waiting for you in heaven. Consider that possibility. Especially if the rest of the, world, the, 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 the Bible indicates heaven is a gift. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is in heaven. Hey, we got verse 12. We got 11 verses before it. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Mourn, gentle hunger and thirst for righteousness, merciful, pure. These are things you do because you get reward in heaven, not the reward of being taken to heaven. In heaven, when you get there, you'll be rewarded for faithful service. Okay. Just to give you an idea, elsewhere. Let's go elsewhere. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Memorize this verse. For by grace... That means unmerited favor. You didn't do anything to get it. You have been saved. I have been saved perfect tense. I have been saved forever from the point of faith. Because it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. So when you exercise your faith, 
you have been saved forever. Then that, that salvation, it's neuter, that salvation is not your faith. That salvation is not of yourselves. You didn't do anything to get it. Believing in something doesn't do anything. If you believe the sky is blue, what did you do to make it blue? No, you just accept and believe that it's blue. What you do, I believe it's great weather today. Did you do anything to make it great weather? No, you're just enjoying it passively. And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift. Oh, what's the word gift? The gift of God. Look it up. Elsewhere it says salvation is a gift as well. So, going back. Consider the false doctrine that the believer does not go to heaven when he dies, but joins into God instead. Well, we already refuted that. Let's move on. John 14, 2 to 3. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Are you happy with that? And if I go and prepare a place for you, so he's going to, you're staying here, he's going to prepare a place for you and in the Father's house. Another word for heaven. Are we happy with that? I will come back to earth, since that is where the disciples were, and by dint of that, association with that, we who are believers are disciples, and we get the same destiny and a place prepared for us in the Father's house in heaven. And he'll come back to for us, take us back to be with him in to dwell into heaven in the place that he has prepared for us and take you to be with him, me, to be where he went in the first place, where which could only be heaven. Jesus came from where? Heaven, not another planet. That you may also be where I am, heaven. Uh, can we make it any clearer? I am going, I will come back. Does not refer to our Lord's going in death and coming back in resurrection, as some maintain. So it is also maintained that our Lord is not referring to those verses to go going to, to a specific place where rather than Jesus is going to go through death rather than to go to a particular place and that Christ as opposed to Jesus will then become in resurrection to bring believers into the Father presumably to become an integral part of the Godhead. That sounds like a cult to me. We've already refuted that. Consider that the word Jesus or Jehoshua which means Jehovah God is salvation and the phrase the Christ which means God's anointed one who will bring salvation to mankind are both simultaneously descriptive of the Son of God, especially in his redemptive role of bringing redemption to mankind. One term cannot be considered as solely descriptive of the person of the Son of God in exclusion of the other, as is presented by some who maintain that it is Jesus, it is Jesus who dies and the Christ who returns. Scripture simply does not support such a distinction. But that's not in the case of this email, but I just wanted to refute those things ahead of time in case people have some objection to that. So, previous to John 14, 2 to 3, by the way, is John 7, 33 to 34. Jesus had spoken of his impending departure. Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time, and then I go to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. John 12, 23 and 35, Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Then Jesus told them, You are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. This departure to a place where the disciples for the moment could not follow obviously could not mean death. For the disciples could have followed our Lord in death at any time, which they all eventually did. So I'm refuting these objections as you go through it. Furthermore, a substitution of the concept of death in verses 2 and 3 quickly refutes the point of view that our Lord's going was an expression of his going through death, for it turns the passage into something nonsensical. What else can we look for that <laughs> objectors maintain? Okay, we got heavenward. You know the place where I'm going refers to our Lord's going to heaven. So I hope this, besides this complete study in the rapture, which reaffirms 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18, clearly presents the rapture and the second coming as different events. And what the rapture is, he's coming back for the saints, to bring them back, and then we have the tribulation period. Hopefully that proves my case.